Thing. Order! Order! You are an incorrigible delinquent at times. <laughs> Behave yourself, man! Now, who is your political hero? Well, that's the question we'll be asking leading politicians in a new series here on The Daily Politics. In future weeks, we're going to be hearing from MPs and peers, including William Hague, Vince Cable and Emily Thornberry. But today, it's the turn of the leader of the opposition, Jeremy Corbyn. He's chosen the 18th century campaigner for women's rights, Mary Wollstonecraft, and he's been speaking to Elizabeth Glinker. <laughs> Jeremy Corbyn, who is your political hero? Mary Wollstonecraft. OK, so tell me about her. Well, we're in the chapel. Over there is where she used to sit and worship. And uh, Mary came to this place as a 25-year-old in order to found a girls' school. It didn't actually last very long, but it was the principle about um, women and girls' education that she was passionate about. Born in London in 1759, Mary Wollstonecraft is considered by many to be the mother of modern feminism. A radical thinker, novelist and writer, her love affairs and ideas scandalised polite society. She was a kind of um, historically suppressed figure, if that's the right word. She uh, had a, an approach which was, uh, these days I suppose you'd describe as um, sexual freedom or free love to some extent and the uh, moors of the 19th century couldn't cope with that for women. So many people will be surprised that you have chosen this proto-feminist, but they might have expected you to pick a more kind of clear socialist thinker. So why her? Well, because she had a complicated life and she was always exploring. And I just think the process that she went through in her life shows that if you think hard enough, you can actually change a lot of things. And she didn't know it at the time. She was fundamental to changing attitudes between men and women. She didn't want women to be superior over men. She wanted women to control their own lives. Written when she was 33, her most famous work, A Vindication of the Rights of Women, confounded the social order by imagining a world where women were the equals of their husbands. How did you first come across her? Well, I knew you were going to ask that. It must have been um, probably 1970s, I should think, because a number of us were very active in the Labour Party on um, women's right to choose and uh, women's rights to representation. And uh, I think it would have been about then. And I'm sure my mother would have been talking about her. My mother talked about a lot of things. But I'm sure she would have talked about <laughs> And I'm Mary sure you listened, didn't you? At I always listen to my mother. <laughs> Everybody should listen to their mother. <laughs> Good advice. Inspired by the ideals of the French Revolution, Mary travelled to Paris in 1792. When the hardline Jacobins seized control the following year, she saw friends executed and was herself in danger. She was fascinated by the ideas of liberation that the French Revolution offered to obviously a vast majority of very, very, very poor people in France, but also she saw it as an opportunity for women to be liberated from their family enslavement as well as their social enslavement in the whole country. And even at the height of the terror of Robespierre and the Jacobins executing people willy-nilly all, all the time, she still supported the principles of the revolution and she felt that the reign of terror would pass. While in Paris, Mary had given birth to a daughter by her lover, the American adventurer Gilbert Imlay. When he left them, she would return to England and attempt suicide. But it was back in London that she fell in love with and married the philosopher William Godwin. Her and uh, Godwin had two houses next door to each other at the Polygon, in, uh, just near Euston Station. <laughs> and uh, I don't quite know why they did this. They wrote letters to each other every day. Do you think that's the secret to a good marriage, is separate houses what, you'd like, sort of, corresponding yeah, rather well, than talking? I suppose it happens. I mean, men go to the man cave in the garden or, if they, or go to the golf course or the allotment or something, and women go somewhere else in order to be on their own. They just 
took it a bit further and had two houses. But I couldn't quite work out why there was a need to write to each other every day because they could have chatted over the fence. Tragically, Mary would die just days after having given birth to her second daughter. Also called Mary, that little girl would go on to write the literary classic Frankenstein. It would be many more generations before her mother's legacy would be truly appreciated. She didn't set out to create a legacy for herself. She didn't set out to make herself famous. She didn't set out to be a leader of anything. It she sounds just, like someone else we know. She just believes in something <laughs> I can't imagine. <laughs> She remains little known by some people. So if you were going to kind of pay tribute to her, what would you say? She stood for what she believed in. She said that girls are as good as boys, that women are as good as men, and that women should be supported, helped and educated so that they can fulfill their full potential. Jeremy Corbyn, thank you very much. Thank you. Well, that was Jeremy Corbyn's political hero, and next week it will be the turn of former Conservative leader William Hague. Claire, what did you make of his choice for political hero? Listen, I'm not often excited by Jeremy Corbyn, but this was an inspired choice. I mean, absolutely brilliant, because Mary Wollstonecraft, in so many ways, uh, represents that fight for liberation. I, I love her because of her commitment to reason. She came out of enlightenment thinking. She was a supporter of the French Revolution. She was complicated, all of the things that he in fact said. It's to his credit he said it. And I, I thought as he was speaking even, it was a reminder of where the roots of women's liberation came from and that demand for equality and, and how long it's taking and sexual <laughs> liberation. Well, no, my fear is that, <laughs> that sadly that contemporary feminism, which seems to you know, wallow in its own victimhood and 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 la loss, loss of agency has forgotten the, what the gains of sexual liberation really could have been well, or were. Raphael, do you think Mary Wollstonecraft was a safe choice for Jeremy Corbyn? That he didn't go for what people might have expected in terms of a sort of great political revolutionary? And is this part of Labour's softening sort of presentational approach? John McDonnell's in Davos for the first time. Yeah, I think, look, I mean, it's obvious from the way he's, he's, he spoke about the subject that he, he knows a lot about it and, mm. and cares about it. So his interest uh, and support for, yes, for the process is sincere. Yeah. Um, it, it would also be naive to, to imagine that, that when the request comes in, do you want to do this slot, who's your hero? They don't <laughs> sit down at a, basically a committee and go, right, yeah. who should we choose that will project exactly the kind of thing that we most want to project? Well, we don't. And it would be enormously crass of him to choose uh, some sort of macho revolutionary political figure. I mean, the, the days when John McDonnell was throwing the sort of the Mao's little red book across the dispatch Why? box, well gone, because they nearly, they did much better in the election last year than they thought they would do. They've now so tasted power, they've got a sniff of the fact they might form a government, and they're being much cannier and much cleaner about Listen, the way they present themselves. Uh, no she was a woman uh, revolutionary. She wasn't a soft option to the hardcore uh, revolution. That's a very good right. point. She was but actually a leader of it. Well, you got your word in there. <laughs>